recording now, okay? All right, very good. Now we are already live. This is Heidi from the Wisdom Factory, and we are in the series Conscious Aging. And today I have Sue Breitman, and the topic is a call for further becoming. And before we, before we, you tell me what you mean with that, uh, please say some words about yourself, where you are, how you are connected to conscious aging and so on. Sure, great. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be in this conversation and uh, really applauding, Heidi, what you're doing with the whole conscious aging domain. Um, it is such a topic that is up for us. So I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'll just say in the here and now, I am sitting in my office in Boulder, Colorado. It's, uh, it's fall here. And so right behind the, uh, the camera where we're recording is this gorgeous tree. I'm looking at it beyond uh, this, this iPad. And there are all these bright colors, yellow and red and green. It's, it's a beautiful time of year in Colorado and also a very short time. So fall comes and goes before we know it. Uh, so that's, that's a feel for the morning here in mountain time zone in the US. Uh, I'd say in terms of how I, I have to think about how I came into knowing about your conscious aging domain and this whole, um, what you're building with these video casts and the blogs and everything. I may have first come across you uh, on Facebook, and it might have been through a, an integral saging Facebook page, but I don't remember. You know how that is. We don't always remember. How, how did I first link up? But I know that when I did, of course, what you're doing spoke very much to me because of the work I've been doing in the last few years, which, which I'd love to talk more about. So um, since that time, you and I connecting my my reading your blogs and watching the, the videos on your site and seeing the work of Ann Roberts, uh, which I'm really excited about. So that's, that's how I came to connect in, into you. Okay, so now we start that you tell me what you mean, the further becoming. Mm. Yes, I love talking about the call to further becoming. Um, so I'll, before I come into how I, how I crafted those words, because for me, my work is very much about further becoming, which is a different way of languaging aging. But I'm going to back up and say where my work started, because it has everything to do with how that kind of came online for me, that notion of further becoming. Years ago, probably about five years ago now, um, I, I found myself in a life situation that is very familiar, I know now, 100 interviews later with women over 50, is quite common. And that is that I was in this, at this crossroads after 29 years of working as a consultant and a coach in the field of organizational development. So I did a lot of leadership development and, and, and consulting around conscious business and loved my work, loved it. I felt really fulfilled by it. Um, and I could feel it coming to a natural conclusion. And I've made this point when I talk about this because it was not a sense of, I don't do this well anymore, um, but more a sense that I was feeling done with it, but also feeling so alive mm -hmm. and so healthy and zesty and knowing that I wanted to continue making a contribution, you know, whether it's through work, whatever way, and recognizing that it was not a downward arc for me of wanting to come into what used to be called traditional retirement. Honestly, I don't know what that looks like anymore, and we can talk about that. But rather, it was sort of this big question of what now? What now? What does one do? when you've had 25 or 30 years on a certain path, what, whatever it might be, and it 
it feels as if it's coming to a conclusion and yet we sit poised with so much to offer and so much wisdom and experience and we're healthy and we're vibrant um, and so i was sitting in that place wildly curious about what is this stage of life about am i the only one that feels this sense of complete bewilderment about what's next mm -hmm. and i'm going to fast forward to say that i decided I, I came across the work of mary catherine bateson mary catherine bateson is a social anthropologist margaret mead's daughter i got a hold of her book composing a further life and i came to this page where mary catherine bateson says that for the first time in human history there is a new developmental stage of life that we've never had before that we no longer go from adulthood to elderhood and i know you know all this but i'm tracing i'm tracing my own sort of journey to this moment and my work that we no longer go from adulthood to elderhood and i certainly didn't feel like an elder and i don't um, but there's this new stage of life called adulthood too mm -hmm. and she calls it the age of active wisdom and she says actually i brought a quote with me heidi because i thought i might want to touch on this she says we've opened up a new space part way through the life course a second and different kind of adulthood that precedes old age and as a result every stage of life is undergoing change i call it adulthood too and we right now are pioneering what it is yeah, and so i i found that heidi i read that and i thought no wonder I and so many of us feel kind of disoriented at this stage. And um, it's from that that I made the decision to interview 100 women so that I could better understand what, what's going on at this stage of life, what are we discovering, and what maybe are the new tracks that we're laying down for ourselves and then for generations to come. And I, I began thinking about it, not as, um, well, yes, there's an aging component to it, but it's really this sense of further becoming. And it's a call. To me, it's a call. It's, it's a call that I heard, and it's a call that I hear women in my coaching practice, for example, feeling and being attracted to. So that's why I decided on this language, um, a call to further becoming, because that's what I think we're, we're always doing. That's a, that's a wonderful uh, image, to become further. And uh, I want to share a, a small story. Lately, we were on the internet in a, in a um, conversation with several people, and uh, we were meditating together. And then one person said about me that she is seeing me like in a fairy tale, uh, opening my hand and golden stars fall into my hands. And I wow. thought, this is exactly the stage in which we are. We have oh. golden stars, which we can now we have become the golden stars, not got the golden stars by our lives, and now we can give them, you know. I, I love that. I love, what a beautiful image. Isn't it? I love that. The golden, um, can I pick up on that? Yes. I'm just maybe, maybe going to, um, what's the word, riff with you a little bit. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm imagining that visual. Mm -hmm. And the, so the golden stars, I mean, how did you, what, what do the golden stars represent to you? I know how I heard that. I'm curious how, how that struck you when you heard it. I know the, the, the children's story, no? It's a fairy tale in German. Uh, but I saw it as a harvest. I get now in my hands or in my lap, but it's the same thing. Uh, I get at this position, the golden stars, they are now falling on me, mm -hmm. which I had all the time sort of tried this, tried that, tried this, tried that, 
and gained experience, gained insight, observing the world and life. And so, and it seems to be that now the period comes where I can use this experience, you know, and the golden stars were for me, like gold is very good uh, no, <laughs> because it's oh. precious. And uh, I have them now at disposition. They're not anymore up there somewhere or there or there, but they are near me and I can use them for the further becoming using your words. I love that. Uh, um, there, there are a couple of things that, that um, are happening within me as I picture the golden stars and them falling and you, you capturing them. One of them is that um, I remember hearing um, Ron P Pelvney, am I saying his last name correctly? Um, I think that's his name who's done a lot of, um, and if not, we're going to correct that in whatever write-up goes out with this, because I want to make sure I get his name correct. I think it's Ron Pelvney who talks about conscious aging. And one of the things that he says that meant a lot to me prior to my doing these hundred interviews was that we, we do have to have developed the capacity to recognize and capture the golden stars. So getting to a certain age, having lived X number of years, perhaps unfortunately doesn't mean that we necessarily recognize the gold that is available to us, nor that we've developed the, um, the receptive capability to receive and, and honor and then be in a position to share the golden stars. Now, I think those are probably everybody who connects into your, your site is very aware, very conscious. So, um, because otherwise they wouldn't be attracted to, right. to listen to right. these things. Yeah. Right. And so it, 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 it honors the fact that we've developed a consciousness and a capacity to have learned from our life experiences and our heartbreaks and our losses and our massive setbacks that every one of us have had you know the the i know devastations is a is a is a hard word but probably if we've gotten to 60 65 70 we can name things that have been so devastatingly unexpected right and the capacity to metabolize those and come out with golden stars exactly. with wisdom with the resilience that we build i call it elegant resilience with what what it creates in us as a capacity to share with others um, and to do higher level work if you will there's a phrase i came across heidi when i was interviewing the hundred women i interviewed a minister and I, we were talking about um, some of the challenges she's had in her li life. And um, I heard many, many challenges you can imagine from the women I interviewed. And um, being a minister and then deep, she, she has a deep capacity, of course, to think what's the spiritual import of this. And she said, you know, um, it's not our achievements that define us. It's how we handle the tribulations and the trials and the challenges. And then she said, those are the anvil of our becoming. And I said, oh, Marty, can I give you credit, Marty McMain, for naming that phrase? And Heidi, I devote a chapter in my book to the anvil of our becoming because just like you're talking about with these stars, we, we learn when we look back that who we have become and how we have um, uh, etched, allowed ourselves to be etched spiritually and intellectually and uh, et cetera, physically, all these ways, comes from those experiences that we've had that are not the, the achievements and the awards and the crowd that's clapping for us. I mean, hopefully those things have happened too and they've been wonderful, yeah. but uh, the anvil of our becoming 
is what I think allows those stars, you know, they don't just drop, they've come from um, what you have lived. They've come from what you've lived and those stars are unique to you, I think. Those, your individuality that nobody else can ever replace. So I, you've given me this gift of this image that she, um, that she saw and shared with you. I just, I just love that. I can make a lot of meaning out of that. It's just beautiful. Yeah, it's wonderful. I found that too. It was, you know, like, um, how do you say, a confirmation of what I'm sensing, what is going on. But coming to the challenges and how we handle the challenges, I think it's exactly right. And uh, I think about mothers who try to hyper protect their children from all the bad things all around. They deprive their children to, to learn from the experience, you know? And then as adult, um, it's so much fear. And um, then you, you don't have the need to go through the challenges. And so I think it's really a, a missed opportunity to 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 get to the golden stars you know because they will be maybe silver but it maybe even only copper when you haven't had the opportunity to do really stupid things but you have to come out somehow and it's good if you have help to do that you know you don't need to do it alone but you need to have challenges in life to to go because without challenges who would go <laughs> Right. Yes. Yes, I know. And the um, do do you think do you think that we have a tendency to overprotect our children? Yes. Yes. Especially mm -hmm. the green uh, worldview, you know, the green meme they started, but also the blue. Uh, everybody. It depends on the personality type too. You know, when you the mother is super anxious. I observed lately. Um, I was in a bar here in Italy outside of my dog there and there was a mother with a small child and the child wanted to go to the door was all, you know, like this. And the mom said, no. And the grandmother said, no, attention, attention. And I, told, I said to them, you are creating a, a person who has lifelong fear of, uh, of a dog. And my dog is a friendly dog. And imagine a, a, a person has to run through the whole life with a huge fear of every dog they see because their mother have always said, no, 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 out of their own fear. And yeah. this for me is not a good way of, uh, of protecting a child. <laughs> you yes. know, when the dog is, is dangerous, yeah, but that is not a dangerous dog. And I was nearby, I mean, you know. So we do that, or many women do that, overprotect their, their children. Yes. And don't yes. allow them to make experiences, you know? Yes. I know um, just talking about this whole um, anvil of our becoming and recognizing in myself, I'm not so much thinking about, I have, I have two children and I ended up unexpectedly being a single mom. Um, and I'm sure at times I overprotected them, I'm sure. And I may have underprotected them, but my inclination would have been more overprotecting. But this story you tell about the dog and not letting the child go to the dog, I'm, um, I'm remembering uh, that, that something I clearly needed to learn some years ago, and this is probably 15 years ago now, and I remember this distinctly, Heidi. It was, um, it, it had to do, well, I'm, I'm making the link with, my neighbor dogs and I'll maybe start there and just say that outside the window of my office where I'm sitting right now I often have the window open and in fact when you and I got started before we recorded I had it open and I said I better close it because my beagle neighbor Piper and Dixie two beagles bark a lot and um, their barking to me is a complete joy now, I recognize that not everyone hears a beagle's barking as joy, joyous, a joyous sound. But I know now, and this is not where I used to be, now I can honestly say that those two dogs are neighbors 
and I hear their bark, that each of them have a distinct bark, and I hear those barks as very distinctly Piper and Dixie, and I've lived here 12 years now, and I recognize what they're saying in their different types of barking. I just mean whether it's welcoming or the UPS driver is driving up. Yes. That's what I mean. Um, we have another neighbor whose yard conjoins ours, and um, just recently she hung something in the tree that looks like a, um, uh, a, bird, uh, a birdhouse. But what it actually is, is a device that when dogs bark, it emits a high level piercing sound mm. that will uh, supposedly uh, chill out their barking. And, you know, all the different ways that we experience sounds and noise and things around us. But I want to go back um, and just say that I remember very well a time in my life where my own boundaries uh, were much tighter. And I remember going to a yoga class. I was working in St. Louis. I was the director of leadership development for Pulitzer newspapers. And this was a, a uh, demanding job. I worked long hours. I was up in front of the room teaching a lot. I put a lot, they put demand on me, but I put a lot of demand on myself. I mean, can we recognize this as women? Yes, yes, yes. I really wanted to do it well and right. They had never had somebody come in and do leadership development before. So, you know, this is what I love to do. Anyway, um, I, I had developed a bit of an edge because I was so, um, I was so, I think, um, desirous of, of, of doing a great job. That alone is fine, but here's the point. I went to yoga several times a week. It was my first foray into yoga, but I recognized I needed it physically and I needed it in many ways. And one day, early in my yoga experience, I was on my mat with everybody else and next door they were doing remodeling. And on the other side of the wall, somebody was drilling. Mm. And I remember, Heidi, that I was in a yoga pose that was probably very relaxed. And inside, I was just so wound up about that drill noise. And it really was disrupting my, what yoga was supposed to be doing for me. And, what I, and the long story short there is, as I found myself tight about it, the yoga instructor said, we can all just include all of the sounds and everything that's going on around us in our yoga practice. And I remember being on my mat and thinking what a novel idea that was to include the sound of the drilling in my yoga practice. This was a breakthrough thought for me. So if I fast forward now, I, I have to say that I took that, I took that on. It was a message for me and I, and I needed that. I needed to relax um, and to be able to have a, well, you, you get the point, um, to be able to include with more ease and flexibility and elegance and, and acceptance. And I see that in my life in so many ways now, including these beagles next door. So when I do coaching sessions, um, oftentimes we will mention whoever I'm coaching and I will talk about the sound of the beagles that you can hear, as well as it might be her cat or, you know, um, we learn a lot, I think, about resilience and about, like you're saying, uh, allowing allowing and what happens when we don't allow and what happens when we're raising children and we don't allow yeah and also being against something in in too, too much against something it makes us so stiff so uh, we we sort of lose the energy of of the expansion of of life and i think that happens often to uh, now coming back to getting older as soon as we think 
that we are getting older, we have these wrinkles here and they shouldn't be there, you know? And then we get yes, yes. crazy about trying to keep young yeah. or at least um, that people believe that we are younger than we are. That is such a big deal. But in fact, what we are doing, we are fighting against something which is a, a, a fight which you can never win. And it's only a drainage of your, of your energy, in my opinion. So why don't we go along with what is, what is happening and make the best out of it, the best in the real sense of, of the best, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. You say acceptance. Yeah. I think that is acceptance in, a, in an active way, not in the, in the sense of, okay, I accept this, like uh, sur surrender, Right. Surrender more in the spiritual way, not normally we say surrender that we give up, you know, so uh, yeah. I don't mean that. Yes. But acceptance, uh, active acceptance. See the beauty in, oh, look, today it's like this, oh, and today it's a little bit even, and uh, tomorrow it will be different, you know. Be curious about, that's what I do, and when I'm a little worse off let's say than I'm now then it's more difficult yes That's, uh, when you are well off and you feel well then it's much more easy but I think the message we can give is also that that's what it is and other people have the same problems our problems are not unique <laughs> and mm -hmm. we can deal with them and we can help each other to deal with them and in a, yes. in a good way. And I imagine yes. coming back to your uh, interviews you did with the women, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Because I imagine that there's a lot of this, what we were talking about so far coming up. Yes, yes, I'd love to. Um, so I interviewed a hundred women um, in their 50s, 60s, 70s. There were a few women in their 80s and one woman uh, 93. And I started with the 50 to 70 range. I had thought, Heidi, that I would be just interviewing women who were 50 to 70, period, because Mary Catherine Bateson talks about this adulthood two stage being 50 to around 70. So I had intended to stop my interviews at age 70. And I, I found that as I was interviewing women and as I was getting recommendations for other women to interview, that um, I was getting more and more recommendations of women who were in their 70s and sometimes mid-late 70s and then early 80s. So I made a point of expanding and extending who, who I talked with. And I'm so, I'm so glad that I did because I've made some discoveries and perhaps I'll come back to this, but I, I made some discoveries that I, I, I question um, what Bateson says about adulthood two being 50 to 70. I actually think that it's more like 55 to 79-ish. I don't think there's any magic parameter but um, so I, I'm going to come. I'm going to come back to that because I, to me, it's a fascinating something to think about. And 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 for for you and all the people who connect in to your um, your work to maybe talk about and and the the active question about when does adulthood to happen. But I'll just say that with the women that I interviewed, um, I I made a point of. Of, I, of interviewing women and not men, because it was my, um, my observation that there's something really special and very alive happening with women. Now, to me, that doesn't mean that it's not happening with men, but I just was seeing it and hearing it in the women in my workshops and women that I was coaching um, and my women friends. It was, had a different flavor than what I was hearing from men. And I coached uh, a fair number of men having worked in, in corporations. You can imagine senior leaders were primarily men in my experience. Um, but I purposefully chose women who live in different parts of this country and outside of the country. So um, I can't say that there was um, equal global representation because there wasn't, but it's a good cross-section of women from very different professional backgrounds, 
very different religious backgrounds, and that was purposeful on my part. I really wanted to hear what's going on in the spiritual domain with women who maybe are both fundamentalist Christian, women who consider themselves spiritual but not religious, women who are Buddhist, women who don't believe in a higher power but look to nature for spiritual inspiration. And so I chose racial groups, religious groups, economic groups, professional groups that were very, and geographic groups that come from different places. Um, as somebody who is active in the integral community myself, I, there was a piece of me that, um, that wanted to interview people who maybe could speak in a certain language, who might be able to talk about their experience. Um, you know, some, some people watching this video might be familiar with the aqua map, all quadrants, all levels, Ken Wilber's work, and with spiral dynamics and such. But I thought that's really going to limit um, the, 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 the swath of folks I talk to. And I want to know if there are some things going on that are across the board. So I purposefully stepped away from that and, um, and threw open who the people are that I talked with. Coming back to the point we talked about earlier, though, certainly the women that I interviewed um, had to have uh, be conscious enough that they had the capacity to reflect on all the questions that I was asking. Mm -hmm. um, so I asked the same questions to all 100 women and ended up with 700 pages of notes. Um, oh, whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, fortunately, from my work in, in doing uh, uh, culture assessments and corporations, I had a process I could use for listening for the themes and mapping them and that sort of thing. And it did turn out, now it took some real discerning um, on my part and patience and a lot of due diligence reading through all of the notes and all of the quotes and all the stories to identify, okay, what is it? Since we are pioneers, about this stage of life, what is it that we're learning that sounds like it is across the board for us? And it ended up being um, 10, 10 themes. I call them 10 declarations mm -hmm. of further becoming. And that's, um, that's what my book is about. And that's what I, um, yeah, that's what I uh, have ended up now when I listen to women and coach women and when I read books and read stories about women in their 60s and 70s and in their late 50s I can see these themes just emerging right up to the top because I think I think they're common to us and I also think really good news is they are very promising so whereas the old well let me let me ask you um because I, 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 they, they really blow out of the water the old narrative about what this age is about. But um, I'm sure for, for every person that we would ask this question to, we'd get a different answer. But just for the, the fun of our exchange, when you, and of course you're sitting in Italy, so it, it, this, it, this, your answer will be interesting to me because it might be different from our view in the, the States and the narrative here. But when you, when you even think about the word retirement, and when you think about maybe what people have said in the interviews you've conducted, um, what, are some of the, what are some of the definitions that have come out? Or what do you think of when you think of retirement? So for me personally, I don't know what it is. <laughs> right. <laughs> I have never worked in this sense of uh, regular work for many years. I was always sort of self-employed or had short-term uh, um, work. So, you know, uh, half part-time I had led a choir, for instance, and, and did uh, lessons, private lessons. So I don't have a retirement. I get a pension in a short while, but is that retirement? I don't know. When I listen into, into the word, it sounds like tired. Oh, Am I oh tired? that's really interesting. 
I don't know. Yeah, sometimes I'm tired. I cannot run anymore as I did before. I get a little bit more uh, breath uh, when I go up uh, the hill and and uh, in the evening I'm really tired, but it's a good being tired and it's, it's normal. Everybody, when you have a full day, you are tired. But does it have really to do with age? Yeah. I don't know. And then retirement, again, you are tired. Mm, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> huh. I, you know, I've never, that is, I've never even thought about that, that in the word retirement is the word tired. Yeah. Um, but your first response, I love it because it's what I, what I myself think when I hear someone talk about retired. And if anybody ever asks me a question that I think we need to, um, we need to retire the word retirement yeah. and we need to retire the question, are you retired yet? Yeah. Uh, and replace it with something different. Like, what are, what are you interested in? Yeah. What are you starting for the first time? What creative juices do you find flowing for yourself at this time? But that notion and even the word and question, you know, are you retired? Um, what does that what does that mean we no longer we certainly don't have the same definition for it any of us no matter who we ask somebody who i used to work for shell oil company as an internal consultant and now people who stayed with shell for 30 35 years retired in what might be the traditional sense with all the things that come with working for one company for one's life and then having a retirement package. But really that's few and far between many of us like yourself, like me, who's had my own business for 28 years, um, solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, those of us who have done different things, maybe women who have taken time out to raise children and work part time, the whole range of what work and career um, has looked like means that retirement has lost any of its, what used to be its definition. Um, yeah. And the narrative that went along with it, like you just did this with your hand. Yeah, it's like going down. It's so negative. Uh, the arc of what spiral, which is really, I mean, if we believe in that, it's no wonder that people become like this after a while, you know, because right. it means you now have to be tired. You know, you have to retire. You have to draw back from everything, from life, from, you know, and you are sort of trash. Yes. That yes. is all in that word for me. So, yeah. Yes. So, in fact, um, this is a funny story. When, when years ago, when I was find, trying to find images for my website around working with women in particular over 50, um, I went to, I, I, well, maybe I shouldn't name what the photo, um, there, there are free photo um, stock photos that you can go out and get. There are a number of them. I have now found a really good one, but it took me, I had to kiss a lot of frogs. And <laughs> there was one that I went to early on and their images were okay. And I didn't want to have to pay Getty images for what they charge. So Heidi, I went to their site. This was probably maybe three years ago now. And I put in different words. I put in retirement. I put in older women. I put in mature women. Um, I wanted images of, of women, obviously, who were maybe in their uh, late 50s, 60s, whatever. But when I put in retirement, there are three images that kept coming up, different permutations of these three images. This is, to me, was just such a statement. One image was people with gray hair walking down a beach. And usually it was one person walking down a beach and there was, there's no one else on the beach. And this is kind of a fun experiment. Anybody can do this. Go on a, one of the one of the photo image, free image sites and put in retirement. So a woman, gray hair, walking down the beach, nobody else around. Now, what does that say to us? It certainly was not a picture of engagement mm -hmm. and connection. So one was 
on a beach. The second one had to do with money. All these different images of holding a lot of money, jumping up in the air with a lot of money. Like finally, the day has come and I have all this income coming in, I don't know. But then there were also the images of people, there was one with uh, a woman hunched over a piggy bank in worry about money. So all this stuff about retirement equals something having to do with money, um, exhilaration or a lot of tension. The third image was a couple with gray hair dancing in their living room dancing in their living room. And so this, this, this narrative that is not connected to the way you are living and these new interesting things you're doing, certainly not connected to the way I'm living. I have no interest in walking endlessly on a, lone, a lonely beach. Um, so the notion of retirement and versus this notion of further becoming and the creative fertility that in fact we we are full of at this stage and at this age it may look and feel different than when we were in our 40s to your point earlier um, but it's very much there in fact one of the women that i interviewed she said when physical fertility wanes creative fertility is birthing and you know, I was thinking this might even be the difference between men and women coming into this age, because often men were working physically, uh, still mm -hmm. at least so far, there are many mm -hmm. jobs where they have to really work hard and they might really be tired. While women, yes, we do also work physically, but we have then this possibility, but not in the same sense as, as men do normally, at least in our mm -hmm. countries. There are other countries where the women um, make streets and build houses and things like that, but in our yes. countries not. Yes. And then we for centuries never had, or for a long time, never had the possibility to come out and develop our own things. So we have a completely different, in, uh, how do you say, motivation to create something new as soon as the children are, are gone. Mm -hmm. Most of the women, mm -hmm. I don't know if most, but yes. many, you know what I mean? So I, it's I, new for us and we are sort of, oh, what I can do, you know? Yes, I, I read a quote in an, um, an article recently, just to your point here, perhaps a difference between men and women and what we're, what's coming online for us as women right now. He said, um, men retire to relaxation after having enjoyed the power and privilege that came with their status in society. Women reach retirement age and realize how much access and power has been denied them and now feel a new surge of energy to express themselves without limitation. I think in this time of, of history, it, it might be like this. Maybe later, not anymore, but at the moment, I think it is. Yeah. 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 So we, it, it's, it's interesting that this point you're making, not only in the course of human history, us being on the front lines as pioneers of this new stage called adulthood too, those of us who are in it right now, but what, what it looks like and what we're, how the tracks we're laying down as women, for myself, over 60, is probably going to be quite different than the next generation and when they reach adulthood too, which uh, they will have models of what it can look like from us. So it's no longer the model of, you know, my, my mother probably your mother, others where it really was sort of a downward arc in terms of, in terms of engagement, more like disengagement, disappearing, um, uh, the whole, there's such a narrative about invisibility after a certain age, but rather the tracks we're laying down, my daughter, when she gets to this stage, maybe there won't be such a difference between men and women for the, for the reason that we're identifying now that the power structures are also changing, though they're changing slowly. 
but I think that will that will inform what this 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 stage of life looks like up ahead. Yeah, I want to say my mother, sort of by by chance, <laughs> was already a pioneer without knowing that because. Uh, when my father died, he was a local po politician and she was first devastated, didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And then uh, she lives in a nice area with a little lake and a piece of meadow. And then another house would have been built and she, uh, a street. For, I hear an echo. Could you mute yourself a moment? Sure. I don't hear it, but uh, okay. let me check that. Anyway, and so the street was um, uh, being about to be built and she was so angry about that. And she began to protest against it and she created a, um, a how do you say, a citizen's association or something. And then they collected um, uh, plastic and did the first uh, experiment, fi found uh, factories who did the recycling, that's in the 70s. And so she, because of the anger that they were destroying her neighborhood, the nature of her neighborhood, she developed this, uh, um, this power. And what she has learned, she didn't even know that she had learned it by my father's profession, but obviously she did, because it was sort of a political force then in, this, in the town where I lived. So that was an unconscious <laughs> further becoming, you know? It just pushed by emotion, but ours is more a conscious one, I would say. Yes. Uh, let me check. I just unmuted myself. Are you still getting an echo? Oh, good. The yeah. echo is when I talk. You know. I okay. Um, all right. So let let me know as we continue if you want me to unmute again when you're talking. But I was just thinking, Heidi, in that story about your mother. Um, I I I agree. I think women coming before us of other generations, they, um, some of them anyway, despite what the cultural expectations and limits were, they were finding ways to express themselves. But the options were so much less, of course, for their entire lives, let alone in later years. What I found um, in the 100 interviews that I did, uh, and your mother's story reminds me of this, is that we are we are finding ways, and we're it's it, not only are we finding ways. It it seems to feel important to us, and I heard this over and over again, of identifying how we want to leave a legacy, and what that looks like to me and to you and to each woman individually, based on what it is that she cares the most about. So in that example with your mother, there's something that, um, that she felt angry about. I mean, Andrew Harvey talks about what it is that bothers us is often the thing we can look to that gives us a sense of purpose that we might want to enact our own energy around. If, we, if so, for somebody who says, I don't know what my purpose is or I don't know what I wanna do, well, one place to look is what really bothers you. Is it climate change? Is it the way that the downtown garden in the community park is not being taken care of anymore? It, no matter how large or small, your mother, you know, she rose up with this sense of righteous indignation. It's something she really cared about. Um, and and I, I heard this, I heard this, from a sense of women being both lit up about the legacy they want to leave and what they're pouring themselves into. And then I have to say also that I heard from women who weren't clear about what legacy to leave or how to leave one. You know, what does that look like for me? So I, I also honor that these are deep questions that matter a lot to us um, at this stage. Uh, if, we, if some women, their, their grandchildren, um, that is pouring love and caring into grandchildren is a way of leaving a legacy that is like no other. 
and I heard women speak about that. Other women, one woman I interviewed in the state of Washington in the US, who climate change and what's happening outdoors is just um, uh, so central to who she is and what she cares about. She's absolutely pouring herself into doing everything she can locally in the beautiful environment where she lives um, to reverse as much as possible and protect the marshes and the forests in this location in Washington. So just coming back to how that seems to be important in a soul sense to us at this stage also is how and what is the legacy that I want to leave, no matter how large or small. And then this question, how do, how do we leave a legacy and how do we mentor others when there's no village in yeah. which to do it? Yeah, and uh, the only legacy was to, to be a grandparent, you know? We didn't have any other choice as women to, as to be a grandparent and help the family of the children, you know? And now that has opened up so much. We, probably some of us who have children, I don't, uh, have then um, a problem when they are expected to, to be grandmothers and grandfather and say, no, no, I want to do something for myself. I don't know if that came up in your uh, interviews too. I'm muting and unmuting just so you don't have your echo. It, it did and it came up, um, it came up in, in three ways. One, I'm remembering a woman in Texas who reached the top of her game in corporate America, in the oil and gas. I mean, she broke through glass ceiling after glass ceiling, a uh, very senior leader in a global company. Um, so when you talk about achievement and retired early and her, the heart of her world now is um, being involved with her grandchildren. She moved close to where her adult children live. She's doing some other things, but for her, that's where she wants to put her energy. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, I talked with women who said that grandparenting was really important to them, to staying in close relationship and deep connection with family and that that wasn't enough for them to feel that they were channeling their creative creativity and their desire to um, to continue to grow and learn. So it was a, a both and, like I'm being careful not to get lost in just grandparenting. Now the first woman would not say just grandparenting, but I did I did hear that. And then I have to say too that I talked with women when I asked women about, uh, one of the questions I asked Heidi was what weighs on you the most? And I heard a, a variety of answers to that. One of the ones that I heard was women who either don't have children or the adult children that they have are not present in their lives and are not going to be there if there are physical difficulties if there is a disability that comes about unexpectedly. And so, I mean, there are a lot of takeaways, a lot of things that I, I hear in all of that, but one of them is it's sure not a one size fits all, the way that we grandparent or don't. How we mentor others, and for some women, it's not about mentoring family members at all. Some family members aren't necessarily receptive. Others want to move in together and have an extended family homestead. Um, but how important it is, I think, that we find our own way that deep relationships are present in our lives, a deep sense of connecting. And also that if this question about What's the legacy that I want to leave? What's important to me after I go on that I have left here? That we get to visit that question, that we take that on seriously. 
because we just we deserve it you know for some 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 of us some women uh, i found are 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 really in the active question of and this is how i heard it have i done enough have i done enough and and i heard that question several times more than several times linked to is it time for me to disengage from the work i've been doing all these years or is there some way that my legacy is connected to putting this into a form where it can be passed along so the question is so individual to every one of us but i love i love the permission that we give ourselves and need to give ourselves to ask what what is a legacy that i want to leave no matter the size of it it doesn't have to be a foundation it doesn't have to be a new business that we build it might be going and 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 volunteering two hours a week at a local food pantry and pouring our compassion and empathy into our local community in that high touch kind of a way but that seems to be an important ingredient to us at this stage of life i'm, I'm curious how as i say that how you how you hear that personally and how it bounces off of the other interviews that you've done yeah, uh, personally to me, it is certainly a question to, to can you mute yourself again, please? Um, I think part of what I'm doing here is uh, the question that does it make sense in my life and leaving a leg legacy as long as YouTube is on, that will be uh, possible for people to watch it if they do or not i don't know but it's at least like people writing books no you have taken something out and into the world for me also i don't know if i would call it uh, having a legacy for me it's just doing an impact for the world having an impact on the world uh, in some way on the small world on the big world it's 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 uh, doesn't matter but but doing something with your life which is useful for for the let's say for the community or for the human uh, race or whatever you want to to call it yeah that that would be for me i think many of the women uh, and men also but there were less men in the series uh, were saying the similar things and actually, uh, you were saying that you have these 10, uh, how did you call that? Um, not guidelines, but 10 aspects which you found in the interviews. Yes, at first, yes, at first, um, at first I was calling them, I was calling the 10 all rolled up together, the manifesto of active wisdom. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah, and and it's it's really interesting, and in fact, that was the early title of my book, Manifesta of Active Wisdom. One hundred, I think I said one hundred um, themes from women over fifty. But I I had um, there were the way people experience the word manifesta. I found was quite different. I to me, I mean, I kind of. I, I, I and um, what's established the word there isn't one in the dictionary it's a feminine version of manifesto um, now with manifesto I think of it as bravado and full speed ahead and hard charging and very masculine manifesto I think of as very differently but originally I called it that but the women that I tested the title with found that manifesta conjured up too much of that masculine this is the way it is and in fact the 10 themes which i now call declarations um, declarations of further becoming are not so much we have learned or this is how it is but very much in the sense of we are learning so right in this moment of pioneering we are learning and the the active learning that's emerging each day to those of us who are in this stage of life i call them um i i call it a call to further becoming and there are 10 um 
declarations from 100 women, declarations, but still um, of what we're learning. So would you like to hear them? Actually, we are at the end of the hour. Okay. All right. And so I would, uh, I would propose that we establish a new, a, a new appointment and that we, you said you have a slideshow or something like that, that we can do it uh, again and then uh, have a second, a second show, let's say, <laughs> on that, okay? Um, Thank you. I had muted you, now, you're, ah. now you are on, say it again. That's, that's why I'm getting these messages about unmuting. Okay, good, good, I'm glad, because if you were getting an echo, that's, uh, that's good. I would love to share those in a, in a follow-up. 10 is a lot to hear verbally also. It's, it's hard to, um, to capture them all, I think, auditorily. So I'd be delighted to come back and share and so them. And do when we do that, uh, then I will do the, also the timestamps where people can see the first one is here, the second one is here, and that's more Perfect. like uh, going into the resource, right? Today was more the conversation about it. Perfect. So, yeah, at this point, uh, thank you very much. And what a delight, Heidi. Thank you for hosting me and, and having me. I've enjoyed our conversation. And people, uh, I mute you. <laughs> um, Come and see the next episode, which we will have on the 10 declarations of the women between 50 and 90, you said. And you know, that's, that's amazing. Why don't you do a PhD on that? That should be a, a good topic and bring us further in the research of this, these new stages of life, which are so unprecedented. So thank you for the moment and we see you again.